Welcome to the fifth uh, Elham public lecture. The series of lectures with renowned art historians, thinkers, and researchers are part of Elham's long-term aim to promote a greater understanding of modern and contemporary art. Through a number of talks that will be held annually, at least three times a year, the series gives the public an opportunity to hear from major scholars in their fields. The lecture series is presented in collaboration with the Visual Art Program Cultural Center, University of Malaya, where invited speakers also conduct a campus seminar during their time in Kuala Lumpur, which I think pa Mas Gun actually did yesterday. And it is my great pleasure to introduce a friend, uh, Gunawan Muhammad, as our fifth speaker in this series of public lectures. Gunawan, of course, is best known as the founder and former editor-in-chief of the news magazine, Tempo, between 1971 and 1998 as editor-in-chief. He's also known as a poet, essayist, and public intellectual. Though having passed on the editorship of Tempo to younger hands, he continues to write a weekly column for the magazine called Chatatan Pingir. In fact, he has to meet the submission of deadline last night when he left us, uh, said I have finished the deadline. Uh, so imagine having to do this every week for the last 47 years, that's good. Uh, so it's one way to keep your, your mind going, as you say. Gunawan is also founder of a contemporary performing arts uh, collective, Communitas Utankayu, uh, which established the Salihara Art Center in 2008 in South Jakarta. Uh, he is truly a Renaissance man a man of many interests, many talents, and many ideas. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Mas Gun up to the stage to deliver the fifth public lecture. Mas Gun, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Valentine, uh, for giving me such a big, big, big introduction. Uh, terima kasih dan kepada semua yang mengundang saya kemari and I'm very happy to be here meeting old friends, new friends and to be invited to speak to this distinguished forum is quite a compliment. Please bear with my English because it's Indonesian English, a bit worse than Malaysian, Indonesian Malay. Simon Soon, who is, I assume, who is from University of Malay. Actually, the text, I have a different text, but it's okay. Uh, asked me if I can discuss the works and ideas of Sultan Takdir Ali Shabana and Latif Muhyiddin, two iconic figures in our region's cultural landscapes. Simon Sen sees it as a way to examine, quote, the artistic, literary, and intellectual cross-fertilization between Indonesia and Malaysia, unquote. I'm not sure if I can do the job, but let me try. Uh, as you all know, the late Takdir al Shabana as the leading member of Indonesia's New Poets or Pujanga Baru of the 1930s. Latif Mohidin, the eminent Malaysian painter and poet, needs no introduction. His works are being exhibited in this gallery now. I must say, to place Takdir and Latif side by side is a curious text to position. Therefore, my emphasis would be on the side of comparison instead of cross-fertilization. Uh, actually, I have uh, my text printed, I hope, and it's being edited by Edin. So this is the old text, but bear with me if there are many confusing sentences. Uh, where's the machine? Uh, 
there any? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This is Takdir Ali Shabana, on, and the magazine he edited and published in 1930s. Uh, Takdir and Latif come from different eras. Takdir's formative period was before the Second World War, when Nusantara, particularly these two sides of the strait, lived under European colonial subjugation and hegemony. Latif Mejin is a different story. Born in 1941, he began to produce his important works in a post-colonial South Asia in 1960s, when Malaysia was beginning to assert its presence. It was a period of economic growth and political stability. Takdir died in 1994, at the age of 84. He remains an indelible, indelible presence in Indonesia's intellectual life, but is no longer a catalyst as he was once before. His prolific, prolific years were in 1930s when he dominated the Indonesian literary landscape with his brilliant and controversial essays. I better use my laptop. I'm sorry because uh, I couldn't read. I'm uh, color blind. He is, Takdir al Shabra is basically an essayist. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, his novels, as well as his poetry, uh, are less interesting than his discursive writings. Uh, His pieces, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah I'm His piece is published in Polemic Kabudayaan, an anthology of the 1935 debates on Indonesia. Indonesia's cultural orientation are exemplary. They define Takdir's uh, corpus of essays as a distinct voice in Indonesia's history of ideas. They articulate a vernacular zeal for modernity. Latif is by no means a commanding voice in this country's intellectual history. But his, story, his poetry and paintings remain esteemed cultural items in today's swirls of taste. He is a witness to the continuing interface between the verbal and the visual. Sorry. Yeah. 
As I see it, Latif's poems often suggest an attempt to produce, as it were, scenes with words. The metaphors sometimes remind me of chiaroscuro drawings with moments of darkness lurking between the clarity of meanings. It's a part of a erotic poem. Many of you may have memorized these lines, but let me read briefly. Tujuh lautan, satu gelombang, di pusar perutmu berposing denyutan purba memanggil namaku. Kuturini bukit kutinggalkan padang luas, aku merangkak kembali ke lubuk kelam. In contrast to Latif, Latif, like these works practically have no link with the visual art. The only time Pujanga Baru, the journal he edited, is interested in painting is when Tagir writes in two parts, biographical sketches of Mas Pirangadi, the Indonesian painter in the 1930s, uh, and around that time, one of his poems, Takdir's poems, speaks to uh, Tuan Pirangadi, a subject I will speak of more in later parts of this lecture. Uh, let me begin with a moment of parallelism. Here's a quote from Latif Moedin's well-known poem. Berlayalah kolek malam dan datang padaku. Hati ini berlagu jua, mata ini berkisah jua, darah ini mengalir jua. Belayarlah hatimu, matamu, darahmu, jauh, jauh. Latif urges the night boat to sail in its total self, your heart, your eyes, your blood, to places far away. The metaphor of sailing suggests adventure and freedom. It's very similar to Takdir's in his poem, famous poem, Manuju Cloud. Let me quote the first three stanzas. Kami telah meninggalkan engkau tasik yang tenang, tiada beriak. Ditedui gunung yang rimbun dari angin dan topan. Sebab Sekali kami terbangun dari mimpi yang nikmat. Ombak ria berkejar-kejaran dari kelangan biru di tepi langit. Pasir rata berulang di kecup. Tebing curam ditentang diserang dalam bergurau bersama angin. Dalam berlomba bersama mega. Sejak itu jiwa kelisah selalu berjuang tiada reda. Ketenangan lama serasa beku. Gunung pelindung rasa pengalang. Berontak hati hendak bebas menyerang, menyerang segala apa yang menghadang. Okay, you can see that the poet sees himself as the spokesperson of his generation. Takdir uses the plural pronoun of kami. It is an announcement of rapture, or better, of revolt towards freedom. Bronta hati hendak bebas. Our hearts rebel, wanting to be free. We, kami, refuse to be attached to a calm, leafless lake, protected from the storm and gale by a lush hill. As with so much of modern Indonesian poetry, the sea, or in fact this world, rolling waves following each other, is a space of liberation. We remember that his most widely read novel, Layar Terkembang, implies a similar metaphor. So that's the parallelism. In their respective works, both Latif and Takir enact a eulogy of departure. In Latif's case, it's probably a return to the idea of Merantau or leaving home, a tradition practiced by young Minang Kabumin in West Sumatra. 
who depart from their birthplace to see the world. But I'm not sure whether Latte's wunderlust has something to do with his Minangkabo roots. I'd rather see Latte, Latte as a peripatetic poet. The word, the Greek word, peripatetikos, as the legend has it, derives from Aristotle's habit of walking around while teaching, which I think is an apt description of Latte's way of producing his artworks and poetry. He crosses border, just as most creative people do. He hugs his night boat, he asks his night boat an extension of his being, not to remain at standstill. It has to sail. Like this poem is also a celebration of sailing, or rather of adventure, reaching a new horizon, meeting new challenges, generating a new world, discarding the old protective one. The old tranquility is a frozen state, the poem says, and the sheltering hill is now a roadblock. At this point, his parallelism with Latif's eulogy of departure stops. Like this, a, fo a foxy for an exit has an exuberant tone. Latif's voice is more somber. Like this, imaginary journey is beyond. The wave evokes bursts of joy, Bergura Bersama Ombak, and the expansive sea looks bright and blue, Gelangan Biru. Latif's passage takes place at night with a hint of uncertainty. Jau, jau. The word apabila in the last stanza is ambiguous. It means when, but also if. The contrast is instructive. Let me say a little more of Tagdir and his take on the art and poetry. Tagdir, in his early years, was a rebel with the cause. At the end, he is a rebel circumscribed by its very cause. His words are a distant echo of the European Enlightenment's cry, Sapere Aude. It is called to dare us to release ourselves from our self incurred tutelage, as Kant put it an 18th century appeal for modernity. Like many advocates of modernity, Takdir sees the future as something no longer articulated in terms of the past. Kami telah meninggalkan kau. We have left you behind. The future becomes the focal point, a new organizing principle. The problem with this view is that it puts the movement of history in a linear image, even an orderly one. This is already apparent in the way Takdir announces the thrust of his poem and the second stanza. It is designed to present the vivacious sea as a project against tranquility, is marked by an underlying regularity. As you see, the second stanza is made of a measured cadence, mostly in ten syllables. There's no, neither shock nor spans. Deep down, you can discern the rhythm of certainty, the telos, the end of the process, or the cause propagated, determines the course of action. Takdir's journey is a predictable narrative of optimism. I believe this colors his choice of artworks. In 1934, Pujanga Paru published Takdir's essay on Pergali, probably the first Indonesian painter employing modern techniques. This is Mas Pergali. Uh, he sees Pergali as a great painter than as a man of new era, of the new era a symbol of Indonesia's national awakening, Kebangkunan Bangsa, 
in the cultural scene in the beginning of the 20th century. In other words, for Takir, Pernadi, like the Buchanga Baru group of writers, is a portrait of the artist as a solitary precursor. I quote him, this is the fate of all great souls coming down too early to the earth in a society split, split into two cultures. They are like towering shady trees, but having a root, they cling their trunks to the wood nearby. So weak is the prop supporting this greatness. Like this sympathy is with the painter's lack of social footing, but not necessarily, necessarily with the aesthetic of his works. <clears throat> In the second part of his essay, I find, I find his criticism to the point. In Piragandi's paintings, he say, one can find neither, quote, the audacity of fantasy, unquote, nor, quote, emotion bouncing to the sky in grief and ecstasy. Unquote. Things of great wonders do not fascinate Bernadi. His quiet joy is to observe the beauty of his land admiringly. Takdir says, Bernadi is not a painter of the tumultus, of movement, of action. The ferment of the city does not appeal to him. And yet, Takdir speaks eagerly of the painter's abundant sense of beauty, hatinya berlimpah-limpahan perasaan keindahan, and his skillful hands, which enables him to transform, according to Takdir, his simple surroundings into a song of the picturesque, picturesque, into a song of the picturesque, I'm sorry. No wonder that in a poem written in 1935, Takdir phrases his affinity with the painter. Ya, ya, Tuan Bernadi. Demikianlah ingatan beta kehendaki. Muda gembira di puncak bahagia, berhias emas membelai remaja, dan penuh riang siar sinar segala. Demikian ia hendakku bawa matahari bersinar di langit terang, memberi hidup menunda tenaga selama mata belum tertutup sebelum tangan tersusun. This is, of course, not only a song of the beautiful, but an exaltation of the joy of life, typical of Takdir's enraptured view of history. I, want, I sense that Takdir wants to assert what he considers is lacking in Bergadi's paintings, the will to act to transform the passivity of nature. The point is an activist statement Beta kehendaki, what I want. Hendak ku bawa, I'd like to take along, to bring about. But Takdir's words, using run of the male expression, betray his affinity with the zone of conformity. Berhias emas membelai remaja, adorned in gold and glitter like a youthful bride. Matahari bersinar di langit terang, the sun shining bright in the sky. These are not very innovative phrases. Here, Takdir, the literary trailblazer of the 1930s, is virtually unrepresented. His ardor for the you is muffled. At the end of the day, Takdir and Pirangadi share the same pre-revolutionary ideal, or boy idea, ideal, if you will. In Indonesia, they call it the paradigm of Moi, India. This is the poem of Takdir and the painting of a uh, Dutch, half Dutch painter called Desinche, uh, the landscape, typical landscape of the tropic. And it represents the paradigm of Moi India, the beautiful, the pretty India. In the late 1939, Sujoyono, Indonesia's leading modernist painter, 
who was later an important spokesperson for the revolutionary Elan of the 1940s, wrote a scathing comment on the kind of visual art produced in colonial times. As he sees, the predominant vogue is to depict, 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 to depict the Dutch Indians, not as a line of contradiction of exploited peasants and worried workers, but as a rustic panorama with a pretty face. The canvas of Ernest Jacencia, a painter living from 1885 to 1972, is a case in point. From here comes the disparaging label, Moi India, Beautiful East India. Tusu Joyono, who later became, became the leading painter of the left, the Moi India arts are works produced for people, quote, who have never seen coconut trees or rice fields, unquote, or tourists tired of their own skyscrapers. In another essay, essay published in 1946, he claims that in Moi India paintings, quote, all are completely nice and romantic like in paradise. All are comfortable in every angle, peaceful, tranquil. It is this kind of landscape that parades Takdir's poetry, a vista adorned in gold and glitter like a youthful bride, he says. But I must add, the band is not for the beauty per se. It is the impulse for the congruous, linear, and perversive. I believe it possesses the vestige of the Dutch, the Dutch landscape painters who were progenitors of landscape paintings everywhere, whose canvases reveal in the flat topography endless lines of water and placid sceneries. I'm sorry I cannot show you examples of Dutch landscape painting from the Golden Age, but you may check it in the Google. Actually, you can check everything in the Google including my speech. <laughs> Above all, their fascination with linear perspective is not only connected to a contemporary scientific mood, but also to the idea of controlling space. Realism means portraying a unified mise en scène. I think there's a continuity between Bruno Lesci's geometrized representation, representation, representation of reality, you know, the, the, the perspective uh, uh, explained by Alberti in, during the Renaissance. The continuity between that idea and the colonialized other. There's also a symmetry between the Moy India canvases and the Dutch colonial administration in Indonesia. In a perceptive study of visual culture in the time of the Netherlands Indians, Susi Protsky points out that there is a frequent omission of the negative impact, negative impact of colonial expansion in the artworks. The shan, according to Protsky, controversial realities. I'm not suggesting that Takdir's literary writings brush off the social and intellectual defects of the colonial society. Yet, like the Moy India in the eye of Sujoyono, Takdir's poetry finds no place in post-colonial Indonesia. The 1945 generation of writers denigrates this Puchaga Baru trait. Asrul Sani is a handsome guy and short. They are, they are together, they're young, they're youth, when you're young, 
and I think the mid 40s, and many famous painters there, and three, I believe, and one, Asru Sani, the poet. Asru Sani, who is like Hyrule Anwar, a brilliant writer of the revolutionary period of 1945, suspects that Tagir understands nothing of the turbulent times. Tagir only sees, no, no. Asuro Sani calls Tagir's Tagir literature is as a literature of the civilized middle class. What Tagir and the Bujanga Baru write, he says, have the order of a fresh shirt and the atmosphere of flat life. Tagdir doesn't understand revolution, the revolution. For him, according to Asrul, the revolution is merely foot thumping on a Sunday morning. Asrul Sani's wit is definitely arc Azerbek. But there's a glint of truth in it. Tagdir is no fan of the revolution and its collateral zeal. He says, we cannot possibly rebel against everything, everybody, he says. He stands against the verer of the new poetry brought about by Hyrule Anwar, who famously claims himself a binatang a wild beast. In an interview in 1947, Tatir compares Hyrule An Anwar's poetry with Rujak. You know Rujak, of course. It is fresh and exciting, but Takdir says, you cannot make it the substance of human life. He, he didn't like Rujak, obviously. This is in line with his view of modernism in the visual arts. He disdain for the, his, disdain, his disdain for the works of Picasso and Kandinsky has a typical bourgeois bent. He sees them as an irresponsible and aimless revolt. His attacks on the modernist, both, both in the arts and literature, are vervet. They, he said, cover themselves with the fog of mystery and obscure language. So no common mortal can grasp what they mean. As a result, Takdir says, their cultural and social thrust will be utterly weak and skimpy. Ironically, the poet who celebrates the stride to liberty in his early poem is apparently the same man who could, who could do with the confinements of creativity. To him, creativity should never, should rather be the production of the useful and not that of the new. Takdir's impulse, as I said, is for the Congress, linear and purposive. But this is precisely what the borders in Indonesian art and lit literature prefer to disregard one way or another. I believe it began with the revolution with a capital R. The Indonesian revolution and the protective war for independence in 1940s, mid 1940s, as described by Pramudia Anandatur in his novel, was the mother of metamorphosis. In his novel, The Tepi Kali Bekasi, in the bank of Bekasi River, a fiction based on the writer's combat experience in the battle along the Bekasi River, Pramudia eulogizes the war as, quote, an epic of a mental revolution, unquote. As with the slogans, say, on the city wall, painted by the guerrillas, addressed to the arriving light force in late 1945, the revolution was a call for equality in a world shaped by layers of hierarchy. That's why the words are in English. They are addressed to the English allied forces came to, may I say, to to take over from the Japanese soldiers, the Indonesian territory. But, and there was a big battle in Surabaya against that. The event gave birth 
to an assertive subjectivity among the lower classes. It produced a shared opposition against the entrenched ideals of consensus. So you see there are common people, young and short, uh, carrying guns, weapons, and other things to join the battle. Uh, inevitably, it disrupted the notion of order and predictability. It challenged the usual narrative of purpose. It implies chaos, both creative and destructive. In his writings, Takdir prefers a chaos-free social transformation. I, as I suggested before, even his image of roaring waves has an element of irregularity. His idea of modernity, based on what Max Weber famously calls instrumental reason, is miles away from the post-colonial works of Sujoyono and Afandi, two foremost modernists in the history of Indonesian art. Let's have a look at Sujoyono's painting, Seko, an oil on canvas from 1950. Seko is uh, a guerrilla soldier who was sent to, the, to, to open the, the, the field for the next batch of fighters. The canvas is an attempt to capture a moment in the life of an unknown freedom fighter. He is a man with a gun standing against the ruins of battle, as you can see. It is a painting of rupture, a thorn of tumult of sky, a town that is no more. The gorilla, barefoot, carrying a rifle longer than his limbs and torso, is walking in a space that looks like a dubious track of, from nowhere. Everything is in a state of disruption. Unlike typical, typical revolutionary works by Chinese socialist artists, there's no bright light on the horizon. In fact, there's no horizon at all. The light is imbued with gloom. There's no clear sense of optimism, but neither is there any sign of despair. The painting sets itself against the logics of linearity. Other post-colonial works are two pieces. No, no, that's too dirty. <laughs> <laughs> One is the moment in the Yogyakarta street. Everybody has been to Yogyakarta, right? Uh, except the king. An uh, Andong, the popular horse cart, is passing. In real life, the equation is marked by an easy-going trot or occasional throw. But you see, Afandi transformed the scene into an image of anxiety, of a half-sized track. And uh, this, uh, the, uh, well, a chaotic passage. The brushworks are impetuous. No stable design in the place. The gestalt, that's the gestalt, the form, the total form, emerges as a process. It is a movement against purposiveness. Now, the other work of Avani, dated 1962, is even more removed from Tadjir's aesthetics. You know, the eroticism is very open. It is a gust of carnality, letting uh, of rowdy brush works in cadmium red against the backdrop of uncertain green. A work pervaded by sexual desire, it emits sparks of lewdness in undisciplined febrile stroke. Febrile stroke. It is a celebration of the flesh, of the flesh against the command of instrumental rationality. In other words, the works have no pensions 
Pinchens, Pinchens, the liking for cosmic order in the manner of Pujanga Baru's poetry or the Moy India panorama. Haider Anwar, for one, articulates a modernist temper against the aesthetics of uh, uh, the aesthetics of, of what is this? of the pre-revolutionary 1930s. When he writes a short note describing the way an artwork work, an artwork evolves. The beginning is a chaotic stage. How is a full stadium, he says in Dutch. And the end is cosmic stage, cosmic and stadium, which is a contingency which is reminds you what uh, uh, James Joyce calls cosmos, a combination between chaos and chaos and cosmos. Also, Deleuze used the word for the paintings of Francis Bacon. The irony, or perhaps the paradox of modernity, like Tagdir's, is that the end is in the beginning. Um, Ultimately, what you have is a neology, a neology of pseudo departure. As you may not may notice, I'm no fan of Takdir Al Shabanas. I'm sorry. Obviously, I have a greater rap rapport with Latif's work. This is, I admit, a biased position. Like Latif, I write poems and produce some drawings and painting, so I'm ready readily drawn by the parallelism between his words and his visual virtuosity. Not a theoretician, it's not a worded theoretician, uh, Latif defined his aesthetics in a very short note published in Charatan Latif, Mohidin, typically using color as a metaphor. Penyair berusaha sedaya upaya memberikan lapisan corak warna atau nuansa dalam menghayati kehidupan harian. Namun jalur fikiran kita umumnya ingin tetap tinggal dalam warna hitam putih saja. The poet tries forcefully to give nuances, layers of colors in daily life. But our line of thought generally prefers to stay in black and white. Poets use words as much as painters use colors. Jean-Paul Sartre says in his book, what is a literature? One might think that the poet is composing a sentence, but actually he or she, like a painter, is creating an object. The poetic unity is nothing but, according to Sartre, a phrase object. In Latif's case, the objects he creates, the austere lines of words he writes in his notebooks, and the unvarnished colors he puts on his canvases, have the simplicity and discreet elegance of Malay pantun. And like good pantuns, it has parts that hints at enigmatic messages. But the message is the medium. In other words, they are genuine images, not symbols. A symbol is a conceptual construct. Latif's lines and shapes are phenomena, like Ding Dicht, theme poem of Maria Reina Rilke, written under the influence of Ronan, the sculptor, and Cezanne, the painter. Rilke's Ding Dicht invites us to have a painterly view a painter's view of things from the outside. This implies a withdrawal of the subjective side, subjective side of the encounter to make the things autonomous. Latus Pagu Pagu series, true to their quality as phenomena, assume no referential, referential content. If somebody asks, what does it mean? I will say, 
say, if you try to find meaning, don't come to Latif's painting. Because their meaning is the outcome of, to use Rilke's words, a half unconscious finding, as opposed to the deliberate search of the intellectual mind. I think the canvas of Agu Bagu underline this. There are pictures of beings without names, like the first patch of earthly creatures. Some with their plant-like shapes, but with omnipresent eye-like dots and circle, suggest an aligned organism with mythical genesis. Some, oh, where is it? I can't find it. Some, like that one. Uh, have the grotesque look of Inca deities. Some remind me of the demons and the Cambodian and Balinese shadow puppets. All insinuate the presence of different energies. In Latif's imaginary beings, the energy is not a substance. It is a process. The process is both elegant and menacing, like that one. Well, I got it. Uh, thank you. The Bagu Bagu, well, you can see the, the things directly. Well, the Bagu Bagu never suggests inertia. They are perpetual metamorphosis. They are simultaneously repetition and difference. It is with such a vitality that Latif's aesthetics transcends conceptual constraints. The works always a flux of deframing. The works always a flux of deframing of crossing border, of breaking down conceptual uh, formula, of re uh, reifying identity. I believe that is what we need today. They speak to us in a time when identity thinking frames the world in the form of identity politics and other things, suppressing the non-identity, as Adorno would say. Poetry and visual arts may not save us from it, but they, like Latif's extensive contribution, can create a different space, an alternative, a story of framing and deframing. Thank you. Because I mumble a lot, my lack of sleep, uh, so I would be very happy to listen to your questions and try to answer. Is it, there's a session for it, right? Thank you. Thank you. Please do. We have three hours. Thank you, Pat Gunawan, for the very interesting sort of lecture. Um, I'm sure there are quite a number of sort of questions uh, from the floor, so um, let's sort of like start with the Q&A. Uh, does anyone have any sort of questions? I'll sort of like come over and pass you the mic. If you do. Oh. Any questions? Or if there's none, then maybe I can start first, right? Uh, no, you, you, you give the I, well, I, I was going to sort of try to ask the floor. Anyone has any questions? Uh, please raise your hand so I can come over and pass you the mic. It doesn't have to be about the floor. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Here, gentlemen. I would love if you could introduce your name so I can, rem can remember it for my future life. Okay. <laughs> Ahmad. Ahmad. Yeah, Ahmad. 
Soalan saya berkenaan dengan um, Pertamanya saya Saya juga merasa hairan dengan uh, Upaya penyamaan Latif dengan takdir kerana Sumbangan mereka berbeza, bukan saja dari segi zamannya, tapi juga dari ruang dan kerja-kerja mereka dalam ruang masing-masing. Kedua-duanya personaliti yang berbeza, uh, 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 yang terkenal di negara masing-masing, tapi sumbangannya uh, memang ada perbezaannya. Soalan saya, um, zaman penjaga baru dan zaman sekarang ini. Kegiatan sastrawi di Indonesia di mana titik persamaan dan titik perbezaannya dengan masa sekarang. Ya, terima kasih. Maaf, maksud saya masa dulu, masa barangkali 40 tahun yang lalu, tahun 60-an sebelum September, sebelum Gestapo dan kemudiannya dan kemudiannya pada proses sebelum 98. Okay. Dan sekarang, terima kasih. Saya jawab langsung. Saya answer, give a direct answer. Uh, I hope everybody understands the question. Uh, let me explain it in my language, Malay, Indonesian Malay. Uh, ketika Indonesia merdeka tahun 1945, ada suatu ledakan outburst kemerdekaan kreatif karena semua kontrol censorship di masa Jepun hilang waktu itu ada satu pidato radio dari Hairil Anwar yang berjudul Hopla seperti meloncat kegembiraan karena kata menurut dia kata sekarang tidak mengabdi pada apa apapun Dari tahun 45 sampai tahun 58, kemerdekaan kreatif uh, sangat hidup. Banyak karya yang bagus dari masa itu dalam puisi terutama dan tulisan-tulisan lain dapat diperoleh. Uh, tapi kemudian tahun 58, Soekarno memperkenalkan, mengubah Indonesia menjadi demokrasi terpimpin. Many of you were not born yet at the time. I was not either. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the guided democracy, demokrasi terpimpin, mengekang kemerdekaan. Misalnya, the press itu harus mempunyai license seperti di Malaysia. Sebelum kemarin, uh, seperti Indonesia sebelum 1998, uh, bahasa berubah, bahasa menjadi bahasa revolusi yang penuh dengan slogan, seperti di Republik Rakyat Tiongkok, di masa revolusi kebudayaan. Uh, it's an Orwellian type of language, acronyms, slogans, repetition, the loss of synonyms, the shrinking of vocabulary. Nah, puisi menjadi uh, seperti daun yang kering kerontang kehilangan udara. Terutama juga karena ada censorship. Censorship dari mana-mana. Lalu kemudian Soekarno jatuh berganti dengan Orde Baru. Bahasa pun menjadi berubah menjadi bahasa birokrasi, bureaucratic authoritarian language. Kurang lebih sama meskipun lebih membosankan. Well, bureaucrats always boring. Uh, nah. Tapi, ironically, poetry tidak mendapatkan hambatan banyak, bahkan merasa perlu membebaskan diri dari 
constrained by the Basan Basa sublimia. So you can see uh, lyrical poems turn up from time to time in the beginning of the new order. Kenapa? Karena the bureaucratic regime didn't understand poetry and they didn't even read it. So uh, we were free, thank God. Uh, the best freedom is from people who have power and never read. Uh, now, kemudian reformasi. Uh, suatu eksplosi yang mirip dengan 45 berlangsung sekarang. Uh, sekarang dengan segala chaos dan sebagainya, karya-karya eksperimental dalam seni rupa dan puisi dan teater flourishing. The quality is another question, but the absurd of freedom is there. Itu saja. Sudah menjawab, Pak. We can ask anything under the sky, is it? Sure. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for going on. Um, I actually followed your uh, editorial uh, ever since you were with Tempo and Compass, all sorts of things. How, okay, next year, next year will be the uh, presidential election uh, between Jokowi and Prabowo. So how, how do you actually um, position uh, your thoughts in the sense that, um, you know, like in Indonesia, the movement of uh, uh, creativity is very, very strong to actually influence the young on what to actually do. So where, where does um, your uh, uh, how should I say, experience in doing this sort of uh, critics will influence the younger generations towards uh, making a good choice through whatever that you have actually uh, written or, or, or all these well, almost 50 years uh, in your uh, Writings. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm not sure whether I have some influence at all. <laughs> My book is never a bestseller. No, I started to paint because the money is easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so the young take their cue from memories of revolts from the previous generation without really reading them. Uh, that's very common everywhere. And uh, what is lacking, you have critical stance on many things, but you not necessarily have a critical mind. And this verse in a time when religion is everywhere. Religions is not an opium of the people, but it's heroin of the people. It makes you, I'm sorry, sorry, for the religious people. I'm a religious with a different mood. Uh, it's very, very alarming. Not the fanaticism, is that, but the lack of critical mind, which influence other not only Muslims, but Christians, and non, even atheists. They are dogmatic atheists, as they are dogmatic Muslims and Christians. And that's what the Indonesian education failed to address, even at the higher level. Did I answer you? So I hope my writing will have some impact in the sense that they will try to understand it, and they never can. Mm -hmm. And they will spend more time reading it. Mm -hmm. or, and they'll be very critical of my writing, so they'll be critical of other things. Mm. Thank you. So in a sense, you're also quite sort of like cautious about um, not um, turning your word into a propaganda, right? Um, yeah. And yesterday you were sort of like telling a lot of the students about how uh, in the 50s and 60s, there's also a sort of like tendency 
uh, in especially the use of the Indonesian language under both uh, Sukarno during the guided democracy period and the subsequent sort of like um, uh, use of the sort of Bahasa Indonesia by Lekra in the way they were very fond of sloganeering and mm. uh, what do you call it? Acronyms, right? Uh, and, and in contrast to that, you were almost suggesting that, uh, you know, with the work, with the two sort of like poets that you have uh, um, discussed today, uh, they have a very sort of like playful liquidity that allows for, you know, uh, reinvention about sort of like moving and changing, transformation, mm. and all this kind of stuff. Do you want to sort of talk more about the value of um, that kind of playful sort of approach to language? Maybe? Uh, I'll try. Well, yeah. you know, language is always with us. We are more or less created by language. Some people say we are living in a prison house of language. Some people say that language is a fascist because we take it from social convention. Uh, and it's very easy to trap people in language, and language directs your thought. Uh, you cannot think about the world without using language, uh, even it's quiet language. Uh, the role of the slogans, the role of cliches, are to put the minds asleep, to distract you from real process of creativity. Language stops being a constant renewal. And that's very easy to trap you into a uh, what institutionalized hate or prejudice. And I believe that poetry can liberate language against that. And that's why in, in the early 70s, 1970s, a poet you may know him, his name, Sutarji Kalsumbari, wrote poetry which we said it's no meaning. Uh, it's against the constraint of vocabulary, of dictionary. So you have, uh, he, he wrote a poem like ping pong, ping pong, that's all. Uh, then, at that time, there was a cleaning popularity of the works of Eugen Unesco, the theater of the absurd, who wrote a piece called The Bald, Bald Soprano, La Cantantris Chauve, using what they, he calls automatic language. So people on the stage, they say things which really do not communicate. They don't think, it's like repeating the words when you learn foreign language. And that's another way to expose the freezing of language. Uh, thank God you have also visual art. The visual art, you, the silence is, is very important in this kind of painting. In silence, the enigma is a vocabulary of meanings, unsaid meanings, and it can be very enriching. That's why the Sufis, oh well, there's Art, Archibald MacLeis, the poet, American poet, who a poem should, should be wordless, like the flight of birds. This is very paradoxical, but it's true. That's why images poet, poetry is, is very powerful to me. Yes. Wayne. Hello, Maskelin. Uh, Hi, mine is more of a comment and an interpretation than a question. And it follows from uh, something that Simon just said and your response, but it also refers to the beginning of your talk. Um, so 
the idea about play in language. But there's also uh, something that we can think about in terms of the structure and the structure of relationships. In the beginning of your talk, you brought up uh, something that Simon had said about making the comparison or, or the juxtaposition. And he had used the word uh, fertilization or cross-fertilization. And you were saying how in, in looking at the, po the two poets or the poet and the painter, you were interested in doing a comparison rather than a cross-fertilization. And what was interesting to me there was how very often when we think of a common culture, we always think of this kind of link of cross-fertilization as if there has to be that kind of relationship. But your insistence on just having it as a comparison seemed to open up this idea of a space for play, that you could look at them in that, that relationship rather than they had this more bonded relationship of kinship or uh, a more fixed structure. Mm -hmm. So I really liked that way that you introduced a way of speaking to two things, that we could do that within our own culture where we share something, but we always don't feel that um, the weight of the bond, that there was more freedom by just the comparison. Well, thank you, Jim. It's very an apt comment because my title is Aesthetics of Framing and Deframing. Uh, Lots of words. It's a process of deframing. You cannot tell where they're from and where they want to go. There's no border. Uh, and you don't want, you don't intend yourself to be put into cross fertilization process. But at the same time, uh, art is open to hybridity. Uh, art is a, is, a, is a way to, to, to search or to reach the unpredictable, the difference, all the time. Even one works of art they create, produce difference and unpredictably every time. And in that sense, the freedom is available. But when you, when you try to, to create a formula, like many, I, I see a lot of dance works who try to combine Balinese dance and, and what? Uh, Martha Graham piece. It's awful, huh? <laughs> Even the body language between two cultures are different. That's why it, uh, let go. Of it. And I, I can see uh, the process of hybridity it takes place, taking place now without any agenda or design. The playfulness is important. Art world, art without play, it's like wine without alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Three hours, right? You could go. <laughs> Please, Shiraka. Come on. I'll start by mentioning. Um, um, and, and, and this situation in the 90s, early 1990s, I met a friend of uh, the Czech dissident and writer Václav Havel in Kuala Lumpur, and he was asked the question, what happened to the works of art, uh, visual art, that glorified the regime when they were in the days of the Iron Curtain? What happens after the Velvet Revolution? And he answered uh, something like, um, the good ones remain hung on the walls of the museums. The bad ones are consigned to the dustbins of the museum. So I would like to ask you specifically with respect to the Indonesian experience, when the works, uh, especially the literary works 
of the writers of the late 50s and early 60s, of those who were regarded as uh, affiliated with LECRA, the honorable of the PKI. Yeah? Um, after the changeover in 1965, pursuant to the debates between the supporters of Manikabu, etc., uh, and the contrarian group, but lately, lately means the last 10, 20 years, the works of some of the writers like Sobra Naidit and Sitor Situmorang and others have gained traction. So how do you explain it when those works were regarded as propaganda at one point in time, and yet at another moment in history, those works remain valid? Thank you. Yeah, it's, I think it's very natural. You swing to one direction and then you swing to another direction. It's, it's a critical attitude toward event before. Uh, not necessarily they are good. When we like Sobron Aydit's work, I don't know, like him. There are many good poets of Lekra, uh, but not at Sobron. Uh, I think they like it as a kind of museum piece, a memory of something repressed. Just like taboo, textual taboo. Uh, your parents forbid you to read them, and suddenly when your parents go to the mosque, you started to read them in, in, in gusto. And uh, that's very normal. And when after the new order came to being, when the, there was a freedom for the left-wing writers, the sale of history books on that area was on the rise, and that's very good. Very good, and it's to address the imbalance of memory. But let's be careful. We should avoid any hagiography, both of the left or of the right, especially of the right. Thank you. We have another question. Probably the last one. Anyone wants to ask last question? Yes, uh, all the way there. Are there any women in the audience? Uh, hi, um, actually I'm a student and I'm really interested in becoming a poet. So as people know that you are widely known as a journalist and I was wondering how did you differentiate your life between a journalist and a poet at the same time? Because as what I've known, um, uh, your journal journalism is quite different from poetry. So how did you do that? Okay, that's it. Actually, I, can, I couldn't mix them together. Uh, from my young age, I always wanted to be a poet. I listened to the radio, the sounds of reading, I listened to the song of the fisherman. I like to be a poet. Then I started to write poetry when I was in high school. But then poetry is like crime. It doesn't pay. <laughs> so you have to earn some living. And I became a journalist. You see, when I was the editor of Tempo, for many years I couldn't write a single poem. But when I was away from one year, I went to Harvard. I had the chance to reflect, to be quiet. And then poetry started to emerge. Uh, poetry is part of extended silence. Journal journalism is a part of extended noise. Yeah, so we cannot mix it. Thank God I'm no longer a journalist. So if you want to be a poet, don't be a journalist, especially today when the press is on decline. You go on Twitter. <laughs> you follow Donald Trump. Okay, we have the last question. The gentleman in front. How you, you, you have actually grown from the era of 
uh, almost a propagandist type of uh, dis disseminating information. And also now, where it's actually instantaneous, you are actually reading to reply rather than reading to think about and to uh, give your thoughts. And, but I look at it, you, you will pause for a moment and write something and it will be a splash and everybody will just stun. Because when I was in Indonesia, looking at your, uh, some of your commentaries or what happened, everybody was still waiting for your comments. Really? Yes. <laughs> so, it's really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, this is actually all my friends in Indonesia watching you now. So, um, how, how, uh, the big brother. Yeah. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> so how, how do you actually um, gain your uh, sting to actually uh, do a proper write-up that will actually give a good commentary that, as what you said, doesn't uh, boils into a chaos, but it gives people to be a critic mind rather than critical thinking yeah well uh, I write so many things different things I write the chatter and being here the sidelines it's a piece of thought it's not an editorial it's a I don't know what it is I talk everything I like or I thought I write every anything that resonates to the concern of the readers uh, and I write on Twitter, which I do it during traffic jam. <laughs> and you see, in Jakarta is a huge traffic jam. So I've produced a lot of Twitters. <laughs> I have 1 million 30 hundred uh, followers, which I think not really written. written. Uh, uh, I try not to comment, comment directly the events. I invite people to, to, to have a pause, a moment, a moment of reflection, and to refer to the past, to other readings. That's why when you read my columns, they look pedantic, a lot of quotes. But in Indonesia, people don't read, so I provoke them to find books and read. Just don't listen to the khutbah. Read, because that's the first word of the Quran. No, recite. Yeah, but uh, that's, I think it's my duty, and I got paid for that. <laughs> so maybe on that note, please join me in thanking Pat Gunawan for the very stimulating lecture. Um, a copy, yeah, thank you, Pat. A copy of the uh, lecture is available on the counter. Uh, uh, yes. Be careful because I sent many copies, okay. version, and the so it might not one be the right version. It's not the right one. I didn't find a lot of yes. faults in it, so he kindly edited it. It was an embarrassment, so I don't want to be embarrassed. <laughs> so you better have a, the right copy, which I don't know which one. <laughs> but maybe the latest one. Uh, I'd like you all to, to join me in giving a, a warm, warm <laughs> thanks to our special guest. That was good. Thank you. Thank you so much for bearing with me with my mumbled uh, phrases. That's why you're going to get, get your copy on the, on the counter. There are many versions, but get the one you like. That's good. That's good.